So, uh, so I'm Edward Lau from UCLA, and uh, well, I was asked to uh, stand in for the original speaker this week, who uh, unfortunately could not make it to present today. So I thought what I could talk about is just briefly um, go over some recent progresses with the protein turnover the data set that we acquired at the UCLA site, and also tie into what we are working on with data dissemination mechanisms and promoting open data access and transparent and you know, collaborative data analysis. So I'll describe what we're trying to do uh, to share both the raw and processed data files, basically using this protein turnover data set as, a, as an example, which will hopefully serve as a model for other data sets from the center going forward. Um, so so while well, I think this whole idea of sharing data touches upon a very important area that the investigative teams at the center are addressing from multiple levels. And there are different approaches that all sort of you know, work together in some way. And at the core of it is, of course, how do we make proteomics or metabolomics data more valuable so it can benefit comparisons and, and method developments to help the field move forward. So I will uh, you know, start by giving some backgrounds and motivations about our data set in general, which, uh, which would be a little bit of a recap for uh, some of the things that I presented in the previous round in March. Uh, well, one of the things we are interested in is understanding the, the alter alternations and, and, well, the alterations in homeostasis of proteins really during the development of heart diseases. And we know that the disruption of protein turnover is, is quite heavily implicated in the development of cardiac hypertrophy and, and heart failure. But so far, getting detailed information on disease signatures and, and protein pathways that are involved is, is quite a bit more difficult. So one of the reasons is, is that oftentimes these homeostatic processes, such as protein folding, aggregation, trafficking, and degradation, they, uh, they don't really necessarily change the overall steady state protein level that much. Um, and the technology that is required to identify time dimensional changes is, is quite different from the technologies that are commonly employed to understand protein expression and it's kind of underdeveloped right now. Uh, with expression changes, one can, you know, you could imagine you could quite easily measure either the signal intensity or the sampling frequency of a particular protein inside a mass spectrometer and then you could be able, to, you will be able to infer on whether the protein has increased or decreased in its general overall abundance under disease states. Uh, with temporal process, you have to do a, a little bit more and have a way to track all the new proteins and to look at the system at different time points and sample multiple time points and feed the data into a coherent model. So the, the investigators at our center developed a technological platform that combines a number of different things um, with isotope labeling, mass spectrometry, and computational analysis to calculate the half-life or turn-off rate of proteins inside living animals. Uh, this is chiefly you know, capacitated by the software program Proton, which we have heard about before from Brian Bleakley and others in these calls. Um, the technology then actually gave us the opportunities to apply this method to disease models and try to understand homeostatic and dynamic perturbations that have accompanied the development of heart diseases. And uh, well, this, this graph here uh, mainly shows a schematic on how we acquired the data set. Um, we started with in vivo metabolic labeling on the upper left here in a cohort of animals. Um, because protein expression varies quite a bit due to naturally occurring genetic variations in the population, um, so in a sense something that, that you find in let's say C57 mice might not be true if someone else does the experiment in FVB mice and vice versa. So we replicated a study in a total of six common genetic backgrounds so as to make sure that, well, help ensure that any results we see would be more likely to be applicable to different models. Um, after that, uh, you know, we collect samples at multiple time points in each of the, the particular uh, 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 sample groups, and it goes through multiple rounds of biological fractionation, for example, getting different subcellular uh, proteins, and also chemical fractionations with two-dimensional liquid chromatography. Um, and then finally, we identify proteins and feed the data into proton, which I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, or <clears throat> so, um, so that's pretty much it for data acquisition. Um, and from a biomedical researcher's point of view, I think there are multiple levels going on, uh, going from the initial acquisition of data sets to how we ultimately disseminate the data to a broader community of researchers. Right? Uh, of course, the unfortunate common practice at least in, until very recently, was to acquire the data and analyze it and then publish it and forget about it. Right? 
So I don't think I need to go into too much details to this audience on why you should share your proteomics data. And I think, well, there are more than just altruistic reasons why we should all share data. And as data acquisition and proteomics become more mature, and oftentimes the room for innovations and breakthroughs are lying increasingly not in how much more data you could generate, but what you could, how you could make sense of it. And uh, that requires specialized skill sets in computer science and data science and informatics, and the data need to be made available to the people who can develop new data analysis methods that benefit everyone. Um, but even as a biologist, I would, I guess, usually, I, I would run into situations where I would want to try to find data sets if only to compare against my own to support my hypothesis and, and so on. Um, so on top of all that, I think we are also very motivated to disseminate this current particular data set on protein turnover as broadly as possible. Uh, in many ways, it's a one-of-a-kind you know, data set that's quite possibly the largest temporal dynamics data set in the, in the physiologically relevant system known to date. Um, so I'll just briefly describe uh, in the remaining of the talk uh, how you know, our experience, I guess, uh, of making this data set available on Pride and Sage Synapse and how I think the two can fit together as a general dis dissemination pipeline that we could adopt in future projects. So we, we, we uploaded our uh, data set to Pride, and uh, right now it's in a private archive, but we actually plan to make it public in the, in the next couple of days, probably before Monday, actually. Um, so far, we have approximately 1,500 raw files on the project. Those are raw mass spec files, and also the prolucid search result files. Um, this is, uh, for now, what they call a partial submission, which doesn't give you a DOI and uh, the reason is, is so far we cannot easily convert the prolucid output to um, the MC ident ML, the Pride XML yet, um, before IP2 um, implements an MC ident ML converter. So I think there's still some room to increase the reusability of the raw data there and have them fully, more fully integrated into Pride. Um, uh, one thing I'll notice, uh, actually initially we we're having quite a bit of trouble with uploading maybe 800 to 900 gigabytes of data from UCLA to Pride. And the, the Pride submission tool didn't really work very well for us on campus, and the upload would stop after a couple of hours. So we figured a solution to this you know, big data problem is just to download the data files on your hard disk and ask for help to carry it to EBI in, uh, in England by plane. So that works, but obviously not a very sustainable way of uploading data in the long run. But since then, we have tried a number of things with EBI's help. And uh, uh, for example, use some command line as per SCP protocol and seems to be working much better and we're able to do uh, 10 to 50 megabytes per second quite consistently from UCLA. And that's you know, what we're going to do in the future. <laughs> so well, the question now is, well, if you're a new data user, what, what could you use these raw mass spectrometry data files for? Uh, we think there are a good number of potential scenarios where you could reanalyze this data set and get new information out of the mass spec files. For example, we know that in a typical database search, the majority of the MST spectra uh, so remain unidentified. And in our current analysis pipeline, our objective wasn't really to, be, to try to be ex as exhaustive as possible in a search, uh, because of many things, uh, uh, one of which is the time constraint of, of doing exhaustive searches. But if you have additional means to identify uh, maybe unconventional proteins or peptides, once you identify them, then perhaps with a new database search engine or custom protein sequence database, then you can find out a ton of an expression information of these proteins from our data set, right, in the heart and heart diseases that are currently hidden in the data set. Uh, if you do an open PDM search or specify a particular PDM that you're interested in, then you may be able to get information on certain modified peptides and, and, and try to learn about how modification could regulate turnover. Um, well, it could obviously also help, you know, develop new algorithms to fit the, the labeling data in the kinetic models and examine proteins that, for example, uh, maybe did not really conform to our current kinetic model. Uh, certain proteins like histone and nuclear pores, uh, we know they have very long half-life and that may not have, you know, they may not have accumulated a lot of isotopes during the course of labeling. Or some other proteins may have discontinuous or biphasic response during the development of disease. So someone could dig in there and look at what those proteins are doing during the development of heart diseases and that would be very interesting, I think. Uh, lastly, I think just, you know, for a sufficiently large proteomics data set, you could use it for perhaps understanding which proteins are present in the cytosol or mitochondria or nuclear fractions of the heart and maybe use it in meta-analysis with, uh, with other cardiovascular proteomics data set. So that's, that's great, but, um, but we sort of thought, you know, having the, the raw data available isn't necessarily the end of, of data sharing, or sometimes it may not actually even be the most useful thing for most types of users. 
Um, the ROM aspect files that we upload are almost one terabyte large in size, so there's the question of how often people are really going to access it and download it, and what kind of users are we targeting or limiting ourselves to uh, who may have the means of computational power or even a scientific interest to reanalyze everything from scratch. Uh, so it seems it seems to us that, you know, for most researchers, having a tidy data table may actually be more helpful, uh, and th that's something that Pride isn't really, you know, set up for to you know, have a table of turnover rates on different proteins. So, um, so, so, so users could maybe take the numerical value of the turnover rates and uh, plug it into their own model and they could just ask what is the half-life of the protein or pathway that, that I'm interested in. So I think there's a lot of bias in sharing this kind of processed or semi-processed data. And I think that's something that Sage Synapse really emphasizes on and, and you probably heard from Brian Bott from Sage Bio Networks at the site visit, uh, who gave a great overview of the system and its intention to be a place where you know data not just stored statically, but also uh, are actively reanalyzed or consumed. So I won't repeat all the details here, but basically um, a project here is that, that we have started uh, is organized into uh, three major tabs that you can see near the top of the, the screenshot here, uh, which is a like wiki, files, and tables tab, so you can see. Uh, I'm sure in the files tab here in this screenshot and you can see a number of subfolders that we put in different file types. The platform is kind of agnostic to file types and we could share different kinds of data at the same time. Uh, we, could, we could share protein ID files and uh, proton output text files, uh, tidied up data sets and codes and images. With the, uh, the, the wiki tab, uh, I think it serves, serves mostly as a data descriptor that sort of continues evolving as we put in more info, information in there. And it contains information that you really need in the sense of data set up after you download it, right? Uh, and how did we acquire the data and how, what kind of pipelines did we use to process the data and what's the, the code book of the data files and so on. And this, this just shows, you know, I guess the, one of the code book pages on you know, what the structure of Proton is and uh, uh, what well, gives you a sense of you know, how Proton processes the data and outputs a turn off array output file. And then it also contains instructions on how to read the file and what each of the columns means. And uh, we're getting into some of the files. Synapse also you know, allows you to share data processing or, or statistical programming codes and maybe some R scripts on there so that if you have a graph that shows, well, I did this analysis and I got this conclusion out of the data, and then the people who are interested in how you arrived at that conclusion can have all the information to either you know, verify your claims or, uh, or, or kind of iterate your analysis to, uh, to look at it from different angles. So I think a, a great thing about this setup is you can, you really put in, they also, they, they really put an emphasis on data provenance and, and what scripts you use to generate what data. So, so you can you can see on the provenance box uh, on the bottom of the screenshot that it, it links different files and analysis together uh, with the processes that were used to generate a particular file from a, from a different file. So that goes with the whole um, collaborative and transparent analysis idea, continuous analysis idea, where you have a data set available and different people or, or informaticians could come in and validate and improve an analysis if they're so inclined. So I think. Um, um, well, lastly, one of the things that you could do with uh, Synapse or similar maybe platforms is to disseminate also a graphical data record. Uh, well, why are they why are they important? Um, I think it's that it, it it gives people a sort of at a glance information about the shape of the data set. Well, in theory, you know, this this kind of data descriptors are not really supposed to contain biological analysis of the data in the sense that you look at the data set or either do some kind of in an inferential predictive analysis to make a conclusion about the subject you're interested in. Um, but I think they do offer the opportunities to include some kind of lower level processing analysis to, to tell people what the data looks like. And I think these type of figures don't usually receive the attention they deserve, especially on you know, regular traditional publications because they don't, they're not really telling a biologist the story per se, but they're really important in telling people about the system and what the distributions of numerical values are you expecting and what is considered an unusual value and so on. Uh, and if you, or if you alter the processing parameters, how does it change the data set? Uh, the, the overall idea, I guess, to tie the last couple of slides together, you know, all these synapse records together, is that you're not just dumping the data on a repository, but actually trying to be helpful to promote data reuse and minimize the kinds of maybe forensic analysis that data scientists would need to run on a data set in order to figure out what's going on at all. Um, 
So for, for the print turnover data set in particular, we are mostly interested in you know, distribution of turnover rates over different samples and different genetic backgrounds, right? So we can show these two-way histograms, for example, show distributions in panel A uh, on the graph. In panel B, we're showing some distribution of protein turnover rate and how they compare with protein expression. It shows a previously recognized uh, negative correlation between how abundant a protein is with how fast it is being replaced inside the body. So it kind of gives you some confidence that you're measuring the right thing that, you know, when a housekeeping protein has, has long half-life and, and as some of the rarer, uh, less abundant, fast response proteins would have you know, high, higher turnover. Uh, in panel C, we have like a some difference blend element kind of plot on uh, how well the protein expression values agree when you measure them with two different ways with uh, spectral counts and with signal intensity that we plot on a uh, polar coordinates. We're continuing on you know, data record and technical validation. Uh, but because most data users right, won't start from the rawest MOSFET files, so it will be very important for them to, to be at least somewhat confident about the initial processing and data wrangling steps. So I think it's important to have some figures that also demonstrate different you know, QC steps. Uh, for the turnover data in particular, mostly you can see that about how well your kinetic model really fit to the data points, right? So, so we're showing a range of fitting scenarios from an L square of 0.99. It's a very well-fitted kinetic curve to, um, to like 0.8 on the right, which we deem as a minimally acceptable value. And you can see how much of the data uh, on panel B, you can see you know, how many proteins you have that remain after each step of filtering. Uh, and you could also explore relationship between you know, what determines good data quality and Panel C, we're showing the relationship between you know number of time points that you quantify uh, the isotope incorporation of a protein on uh, to the proportion of peptides that fit well in time series. So people can make an informed decision on how they, they want to filter the data, right? We can also do different stepwise permutation of filtering criteria and see you know, how much what's the quality of data that remain. Uh, so we can use a, use graphs like this to uh, show people how we optimize the filtering criteria. Okay, so just wrapping up. Um, well, what could, right, what could you use this process data for? And I, I sort of briefly touched upon this earlier, but for one thing, a biologist would be able to you know, answer simple questions like, well, I have this pathway I'm interested in that I pull down, let's say, in an immunoprecipitation experiment. But what would be the half-life of these proteins are they kind of modulated together? Uh, you could also combine with other data sets on these proteins right, and use it to discover new biology and disease signatures in cardiac hypertrophy. Uh, we ourselves did some very preliminary analysis you know, where we correlated the turnover rates of protein with the heart rates of the animals, and then there are some interesting findings there. Um, there are, of course, other phenotype data on these mice available, um, op openly available, let's say, from the Jackson lab that you could use for a correlation or comparison analysis. Uh, and lastly, well, you know, there aren't yet any you know, real gold standards validating a measured in vivo half life protein, so the more data sets you could accumulate. And, more certain we can become in guiding future experiments. You can certainly use this data to uh, compare across animals or across labeling protocols and methods. So, so uh, in summary, uh, just to summarize, I hope I, I gave a very brief you know, sort of progress report on our analysis and sharing of a proteome dynamics data set. And I think this could be a good way to share you know, proteomics and maybe mass spec based metabolomics data in the future, namely of having you know, both the raw mass spec files and search results on either proteome exchange or pride or some other repositories, but at the same time releasing the analysis in tidy, tidy data table with codes on Synapse or similar platforms, perhaps to accompany any publication. And I think it's it's worth maybe having a sort of just a casual discussion on what would be a big picture for proteomics data dissemination and what's a good solution for not just dumping the data out there, but also making them useful for different types of users. And I think, you know, we've heard a lot about this in the site visit, right? Uh, uh, that I think really these processes may be falling into some kind of continuum from uh, data storing pipelines and repositories to uh, surfaces that may seem similar on the surface but actually have non-overlapping roles. Uh, for example, we heard you know, from a Yates lab they have uh, this proteomics integrator uh, program or pines that you know, store some of your analysis for the laboratory and as a way to ensure you know, institutional memory and reproducible analysis before you even share the data with, uh, with others. So that's a different role from a repository that will hold the data like Pride. Uh, Synapse also holds the data, but it's 
probably better conceptualized as a place where you know data can be reutilized. Um, then there are the more traditional methods of dissemination that are not going away, of course, with, uh, for example, paper publication. And we are looking at distinguishing really the roles of publishing a data set or maybe describing a data set you know, in written descriptions and really a, a more conventional publication like a biological analysis. So I think this dissemination process is probably more you know, complex and at least I initially thought, and uh, maybe the additional gaps here that we could identify that maybe could be bridged, for example, just just thinking out loud as a, as a biologist, I think there could probably be ways to disseminate some of the uh, analysis conclusions that are actually supported, at least statistically, by an omics analysis, but do not necessarily make its way into a coherent story in a paper, and those maybe right now would be lost, but uh, I think it would be interesting if there are more discussions on that. So that kind of wraps up my uh, very brief discussion uh, on data sharing, and, uh, and I'll be happy to have uh, you know additional conversation uh, from anyone. Thanks, Edward. That was that was really interesting. Uh, could you share a link in the chat to the uh, the Synapse project? Actually, you know, the, the project is to, uh, has to be shared right now. Because we haven't, uh, we're waiting for the, the prior to go public. But uh, what I could do is just project it on the, on the screen and... Um, oh, the Synapse one is also not, not public. It's private right now, so it's... Oh, okay. Right, well, right now we're still writing all the, uh, the wiki files, but I think it will go public by Monday. But right now, it would be easy if I actually um, just project it. And after that, I think after Monday, you'll be able to, um, in a few ways, you could access this. You could type in this Synapse ID. I uh, could just type it out here. Uh, on Synapse, and you go to the data set. Or you could probably just search for our center on there. Um, so this is, this is the, uh, the wiki that I'm showing right now, right? And uh, the number of sub-pages that you could sub-navigate. Um, I know if there's there's anything you think I could sort of go into. Okay, and then so for the for the data and the files section, those are those are links to the files in uh, Pride, or is the 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 data not not here in this collection of files? Sure, these these files are posted on Synapse, and they are well, they're more processed files with a small in size. This size, uh, well, for example, I'm I'm showing here if you go in the protein ID and the different mouse strings and then experimental groups you could click into and then you go into the day zero and it shows the essentially the CPAS output files, the lucid output files. And you could then click into any of them and you could see uh, I think you could see a preview one here. And then you could also download them directly. Uh, but it would be easier to actually download from um, directly using using a client with the Synapse ID. And that's why we put in a, a tables and the tables tab that contains an index of all the, uh, the protein results. And this is a searchable and sortable table and you could, you could just download the Synapse ID and be able to pull all the files directly from the Synapse server uh, in a client. Um, the pride files are different in that they're, they're only the raw mass spec files in a different location they're not linked to here except you know, with a there's a pride ID in the wiki, that, a proteome exchange ID in the wiki that points you to that way. So uh, before we end our conference today, uh, so we're nearing our, the end of our second round of presentations. Uh, uh, the topic and format of the third uh, round of presentations has yet to be announced, but uh, we'll be sure to give a presentation about it in the coming weeks. And then afterward, uh, we'll release a sign-up form for everyone to sign up for our pres presentation slot. Um, but yeah, feel free to send me an email if you have any suggestions or questions. Um, if not, uh, thank you everyone for attending today's conference.